it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I was hired as a security guard to protect a steel mill. What happened there should be made public. I, I am Reckless 25. Part 1 it's hard to trust anyone after what happened, but knowing that the public will not be informed about the truth has made me worry beyond belief. Maybe it's because it's all too far-fetched? <laughs> I don't know. I suppose I should be careful with what I say, but I now know something that was obviously intended to be kept a secret. I don't exactly know how deep they've got their hands in everything, but after I share this with you here, well... I'm sure someone will be sent to track me down and erase me from existence. Someone's always watching. However, after everything that happened, I don't really fear that, or even death right now, because there's something else out there that is much more horrifying than simply taking your last breath. I need to tell anyone I can about everything that happened when I was a security guard for this steel mill. After I finish writing this, I'll submit my knowledge to a news station but I've decided to share my information here that's more descriptive, and I'll do my best to include conversations that were important. Should go without saying that some identities will be protected. Security guards usually call fellow guards by last name, but I think I should be careful anyways. Let me tell you a bit about myself. You can just call me D. I'm a 42-year-old single male, and after being hospitalized from a gunshot wound from active duty, I was honorably discharged with compensation packets. Being hit with this quick depression, I never wanted to commit to anything other than occasionally attempting to work out and get through the pain. I was gaining extra weight. I hated the idea of counselling and thought about getting a dog, but my pain subsided enough for me to finally say enough was enough. I was losing money and it was time to get a job, so I put in several applications online to become a security guard or anything that welcomed my background in the military. Stick to what you know, right? For years, I made my way through the world of being a security guard, with the occasional aches and stiffness, and guarded all sorts of off-limit areas, government facilities, banks, offices, factories, you name it. Some employers even welcomed my license to carry a firearm. I tried not to lean towards jobs like that, but when the money's right, the money's right. Now, becoming more comfortable in the field of being both an armed and unarmed security guard, I made a name for myself and would eventually do my own freelance work for various companies in private security. Some people get paid top dollar to guard things that even I had no true knowledge of what it could be. Those jobs came with signing NDAs, and I won't lie though, I enjoyed the feeling some of those jobs gave me. Especially the ones needing people with the experience I have, just to keep their eyes peeled for armed intruders and to fire on sight like I was in some action movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger would pop out and start a gunfight. On regular security jobs, you're not permitted to take another person's life and use deadly force. But for private security, things could get more serious. Well, this particular job, after a while, became very much like that. But far, far worse than I could ever imagine. Well, I was contacted by a company, and obviously I'll not be naming them here, to guard multiple buildings for both day and night shifts. The area itself was barren, with a patch of forest to the south of the facility, and own property lines fenced off and marked with no trespassing signs surrounding the zone for miles. There was a total of six buildings to guard, buildings A through F, with A being the closest to the parking lot. Railroad tracks were behind two main operating buildings that were labelled C and D. Building A was where they assembled parts and a conveyor belt ran all the way through to Building C to deliver scrap. Buildings A and B were opposite each other, and by them was a trailer for workers, our guard building, and a yard for trucks to load supplies with dumpsters and a shed for maintenance. Opposite that was the parking lot, and our main gate with a guard that seemed to be there 24-7. We can just call him Phil. Buildings E and F were used for housing supplies, and Building B was basically empty, save for some discarded equipment. The building itself was constructed further away from the other ones. There were four windows in the guard's office, and one that allows you to see the gap between B and A. I didn't really know what that building was used for, but I actually enjoyed guarding this place for the nine months I was there. Well, until they asked me to sign some documents in the guard's building. 
Then, everything spiraled straight into a nightmare. The day started out like any normal day. I don't like being early or late, so I showed up right as my day shift was about to start, as always. I was greeted by Phil, showed him my ID card, and was cleared to enter. I then pulled into the parking lot, got out and headed for the guard's office. Looking around, I noticed two nondescript vehicles parked on the dirt road where deliveries would be with traffic cones placed by one of the vans. Oh, must be some inspectors, I thought. Once I made my way closer to the guard's office and glanced over at Building B, there was a group of men with jumpsuits and respirators gathered around the front of it. They were installing a card reader on the main entrance door, but the actual door was gone. I started walking a bit slower, and then noticed the welding machine. Trailing behind the other men, there was an industrial and very expensive-looking hand truck being pushed and supported by three more of them near the opening. It was carrying a brand new, heavily reinforced door. That was definitely something you don't see every day. Shaking off the weird feeling I got from seeing that, I swiped my keycard and opened the guard's door, noticing I had guests seemingly waiting for my arrival. The man in charge of all operations, Sam, was with two people in black suits standing near the surveillance station. I rarely see this guy ever. I then noticed an extra monitor was installed as well, watching those men outside install this new door. One of the suited men held a packet of paper, and the other guard assigned with me, we'll call him Ray, was already sitting down by one of the windows opposite them. Here, yeah, what's all this about? I asked Sam. That's all right. Let's go ahead and clock in and sit down, please, Sam told me, trying to sound polite. I looked over at the two men before stamping my time card and sitting down in a chair. The two men looked at each other, and the one on the left took a step forward. A pleasure to meet you. How are you doing today? He asked with a tone that did not sound friendly in the slightest. Monotone and emotionless. He extended his hand in greeting. Fine. I shook the man's hand and he continued. I am Special Agent Franks and this is Callaway. We represent Optimal Solutions in a collaborative operation with the United States government to store supplies and other materials that may be hazardous if mistreated. We sat down a stack of papers on the metal desk nearest me. You can read all about us in the packet if you'd like. We need to occupy Building B for a period of time, since it's not operational here. The area will be disinfected, and anything we work on will be contained inside the warehouse. We apologize for any inconvenience. He paused, probably to see my reaction. Mm, okay, I said picking up the sheets of paper and skimming the details about this subcontracting medical research group while listening. I understand this may seem unusual and on short notice for you security guards stationed here. We've already spoken with Sam and he has allowed us access to the building. He paused again and put his hands on his hips. Now the work we do is not only important, but it is crucial we are in a secure location. I would like to explain a few things. Is that all right? He asked the two of us guards, and I glanced over at Ray. Ray shrugged and spoke. I'm already here. Just get on with it. I nodded my head in agreement and looked back at Franks, handing him the pack of papers. Due to this particular work study, the identities of people involved and the nature of the work is considered highly classified, and any information about this cannot be disclosed to the public. I'm sure you've already gathered that we are installing a reinforced door over at Building B. We are asking that you include this area in your perimeter checks during daytime. At night, we will be stationing our men under our direct payroll by those doors. Watching over the camera feed is only required for you then, but you will be given our frequency to speak directly to us on those devices. No one besides us should be allowed access. That door will be used for our personnel only. We're going to be staying within the compound throughout the time we are here. Military rations have been issued and workers' quarters are currently being installed. No one gets in and no one is permitted to leave the premises until we have completed the work or have been given authorization. We've already installed another camera watching that area as well, so it can be easier for you to keep watch while fulfilling your other duties. He pointed out the monitor. Ray spoke up. Damn. Don't suppose we're getting paid more for this crap. You know, keeping quiet and all that. 
he asked, chuckling. That's one thing I liked about Ray. We'd be on the same tip with money because I was about to ask the same thing. He just had the balls to ask first. Your time and service for all of this will cause a substantial increase in your already agreed upon payment arrangements. If you do not wish to participate, you are free to leave, but you will not be able to return to this area once we have occupied it. If you want to return to work after we are finished, you'll have to talk to Sam here. Do you have any more questions? He replied, and I thought about why they chose this location of all places. It was basically in the middle of nowhere. I had to wonder about that. This was in the beginning of November. It was going to be snowing soon. Although I wasn't completely shocked, companies all over the world would occupy facilities for a period of time to store materials, operate in or even collaborate on business within this particular field when supply chain demand was low. Maybe there was something they couldn't tell us. It seemed to me that they operated through more unconventional methods, but that was obviously between Sam and them and whatever was going on in this federal level shit. Well, um, what kind of supplies are you talking about? Is it something toxic? I asked. He just remained still, not moving a muscle, and then replied, That is classified information. You are not to share anything about our whereabouts to anyone, and if you do it, it is punishable by law, as you will read in our non-disclosure agreement, he said, smiling, and didn't speak for a moment. Okay, um, well, how long will you be operating here? Are there any other duties included? I inquired. I wanted to ask so much more, but I knew when to stop prying, and I could use the extra cash. It's not like I could just outright ask them, why are you guys using a secluded warehouse for top secret work, well, without them getting some level of annoyance with my questions. Now the other man piped up. As long as it takes us to finish, your job will be no different from what you're doing already here. You're free to report any abnormalities you may find concerning at any time. We're just spending some time in the warehouse, and yeah, there may be extra tasks required depending on the situation. You do have military experience, Calloway offered with an attitude I didn't particularly like. What did he mean by that? Well, they must have spoken with Sam about me and Ray. Ray had never served, but was on the force some time ago, and was permitted to carry. I looked over at Sam briefly, and he just gave me a blank stare while scratching the back of his head. I gave it a once-over in my head, spending a passing moment to get my thoughts right and bury any red flags I may have noticed. This whole meeting had happened so suddenly, and I didn't exactly get a whole lot of time to think about any of this. Well, money was always a plus, and so I opted to play the grunt I was being paid for by saying, Yes, sir, and then signing the non-disclosure agreement. Ray followed our new orders as well. Part 2 The next two weeks after this were fairly normal, minus the worker that walked out during a shift. I was checking Building C and made my way around the perimeter. This was a first for me, but one of the exit doors nearby flew open with a worker in full gear frantically muttering something to himself. I watched as the man walked towards the parking lot while fumbling with his keys and lunchbox and then disappeared behind a corner. Just then my radio crackled to life. Control 1, this is management. We have a worker going home. No action needed. Out. Stunned, I stood there for a moment thinking of what could have happened, so I recklessly advanced in his direction. Wait, I called out, and began jogging his way, and made it about twenty or so feet behind him. He still didn't slow down or stop for me. He continued walking quickly, turning another corner, and eventually was out of my sight. Well, I don't normally act out of impulse, but the manner in which this man left his shift had made me anxious. He looked terrified out of his mind. It was someone I was familiar with, but I never got his name. He's been here since I arrived, so he had to have been here for over a year. Still jogging, I saw that he was already approaching his vehicle and getting in, so I slowed down and eventually stopped. Phil was flagged and he got the gate open for him. It looked like the guy was shouting at Phil in his car to hurry up. I was standing near the edge of where the parking lot meets the property, and Phil noticed me. 
I could see he was looking at me, frowning, shrugging his shoulders. When I asked one of the supervisors about it later, he informed me that he couldn't tell me why he'd left, and I didn't ask any further questions. He marked something down in his work log and looked up at me. I hate to say this, I think this guy's on drugs or something. Keep an eye on him, yeah? Well, he wasn't threatened or anything, but still. Josh has been working there for three years. Only had one incident with a machine, but it was pretty moderate. Well, no one acts like that here. I'm going to have a talk with him, that's for sure. I just let the guy go home to calm down for the rest of the day. I can't deal with any freakouts. We have a business to run, he explained, and I agreed. I told him I'd keep a close eye on him, and then got back to my duties. Another two weeks passed, and Ray told me something that had me more than a little worried. Monday through Wednesday, I have the day shift. Thursday through Saturday is my night shift, and he has the opposite schedule. Hey, D, you got a minute? He asked, while I was about to clock out. He had a troubled expression on his face. Yeah, everything all right? I asked glancing over at the monitors. He also looked at the monitors, showing these people hauling in huge computers and, for some reason, large loudspeakers through the warehouse shutter door in Building B. And then he looked back at me. I don't know, dude. I was doing a sweep by Sam's office and overheard him on the phone with someone. He then put his hands up in a defensive gesture. Oh, you know me, I don't screw around. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop. I just happened to be near his office with a janitor mopping when we heard him yelling in there. Oh, it was fucking loud, dude. The door was shut, but it sounded like something bad was going on. I heard him shout something like, Hey, uh, how come I was never told about this? We already had a deal. And then we heard someone break in there. We just looked at each other and went our separate ways after that. And he finished by wiping some sweat from his forehead. What the hell could all that be about? He asked, quietly. Well, I just shrugged, glancing at the monitor showing the new door with two guards armed to the teeth and wondered what could be going on that we didn't know about. Well, looking back, I should have just found a new gig right then and there. Well, that same worker was cleared again for going home early and I would sometimes hear strange whirring noises when I go by buildings A, B and C. Well, not anything from the work here, but more like tinnitus. A worker on his break ended up giving me a pair of extra earplugs. Well, they barely worked. I figured that it was some kind of machinery they had in there that was causing the ringing, like some kind of emission frequency or something similar. And I did see them hauling huge machines and various computers throughout the whole process, too. Maybe something with the speakers. Well, this only piqued my curiosity even more. Just what the hell are they doing in there? Having a freaking concert? However, oh, before I could even begin to think about bringing my concerns up to Sam, there was another duty added to my checklist right around then. One of the mill supervisors called me when I was at home to inform me that there'll be a construction crew digging below Building B, apparently to fix some issues with a piping system underneath the building that was causing some kind of leak. We were instructed to watch over that area as well once the leak was taken care of. Yeah, does it have maybe something to do with what's causing the buzzing in everyone's ears? I said, and I heard him chuckle. It was probably a stupid question, but I asked anyway. Well, I don't know. We had to shut down operations today and tomorrow, so you guys got a day off while they fumigate whatever this is and clear it. We haven't been down there in years, so it doesn't really come as a surprise since they got an operation going on. Only natural to find some pipes that may have burst. Maybe it was an accident. They better be more careful with whatever the hell they're doing. But if they clear it, then I don't really see a problem. As long as no one gets killed, that is. He told me, chuckling again. Oh, I'm confused, I said. You and me both, buddy. Hey, talk to you later. Well, the first day I had to work with the extra duty included starting off with me spilling coffee all over my work pants, causing me to almost be late for once. The construction crews were to be on site and would remain underneath the building for the next month or so. Sam seemed to be pretty upset about this, and it was confirmed when Ray spoke about the phone call he'd overheard. There was a huge hole they dug just to the east side of the building, and for up to 12 hours a day, we'd see the workers doing their thing. 
Throughout all of it, I couldn't really keep tabs on everything they were doing exactly. And as time went on, we were given tasks like helping with maintenance or patrolling the outer edge of the property for a time, as if someone would be there. We were to report any suspicious persons and keep our pistols on us. Plus, that ringing would sometimes still bother me, and I was starting to get really anxious ever since. If I was sitting by the cameras, I'd catch myself fidgeting my leg up and down so fast it was like my nephew's video game controllers were vibrating. I'd have to grab my leg and force myself to relax. Not only was I stressed about these new patrols, it was, well, something else. Like as if an uncontrollable urge to either bite my nails off or scratch at an area would persist. After a week passed, we got another hire to come in and patrol with me and Ray on the night shifts only because we needed to do active rounds outside at night now. He was a shorter, middle-aged guy, really quiet but did his job well. His name was Jeff. Never got any other information about him, but this is around the time where things started to get, well, for lack of a better term, pretty scary. It was mid-December and the construction crews finally finished up their work. At around one in the morning when Jeff and I were monitoring the camera feed, I was shaking my legs so fast it was causing a slight tickling noise to occur as the wind outside howled. No snow was on the forecast, just a bit of chill in the air mixed with the darkness of night. Obviously when the night shift rolls around, there are no workers present in the mill and the two armed guards are stationed in front of the new door, decked out in urban BDUs and winter gear. It was here. When looking at the monitors displaying the camera feeds, and I spotted movement near one of the windows located on the second level of Building B. It was through a feed that had to be panned over to get a better look. At first, I could only recognize the outline of a shape, but it almost looked like a door opening. Clearly, someone wearing light-colored clothes appeared past the open door, crouching down. It was already pitch black outside, and the resolution from the camera wasn't all that great, we could still see them. Yeah, zoom in right there, I told Jeff, who was already on it, and zoomed in to where I pointed. It was a person. I noticed they had something that looked like a phone in their hand. I had no knowledge of how to even get up there from the inside. They must have found a ladder or emergency stairwell for roof access. Sure enough, I began to see the person crawling on a ledge and eventually made their way to their feet. I remember them saying no one was supposed to leave, let alone be on roof access at a time like this. Was the person taking a smoke break? It was here when I noticed the person was wearing a lab coat. I sighed. Maybe they were just a scientist up there having a smoke. Jeff looked up at me from the chair. I kept looking at the feet. He wasn't pulling out any smokes. I felt a chill and decided that something wasn't right. After I quickly searched through binders and folders that might contain the map of the interior, I found it and confirmed there was indeed a roof access staircase inside Building B. I looked up to the feed again, still baffled, noticing they began climbing onto the roof now. Just then I remembered what that rude agent, Calloway, had said to me. You are free to report any abnormalities you may find concerning at any given time. I grabbed my radio and changed the channel to their frequency. Hey, uh, yeah, I think you've got a situation. Is there someone cleared to be on top of Building B? I asked over the radio, and I made my way to the window to look at Building B. The radio crackled to life, and a commanding voice replied. Negative. Our personnel would investigate. Out. I looked back to Jeff and decided on going out there to see if I could assist in any way. They didn't tell me not to just now, so I made my way to the door. Yeah, maybe something's wrong. Just monitor everything here, and if things go south, you know what to do, I said, and Jeff gave me a stern look. He nodded, and I got the door open. I jogged to Building B and didn't stop until I got to the entrance of the building. The armed guards had their rifles aimed up at the top of the building, and that's when I saw him. The person on the roof was holding some kind of device. It's too late. I already sent it to them. They're on their way. The man shouted this down at us and began laughing like he was on the verge of a mental breakdown. The armed guards had flashlight attachments and were keeping their aim on his torso. 
Well, I was about ten feet away from the commandos when one of them noticed me. Get back to your building now, he shouted, and I jumped at the sudden commanding voice. Just then, there was that ringing in my ears again. I was so confused and felt a ball form in my chest and stomach. I couldn't quite gauge what the hell was happening just then. I felt like this was a military drill or something, to see what we'd do in a case of an emergency like this. Well, that ringing persisted. It was tolerable, but it sounded like there were speakers all around me blasting this dog whistle kind of noise. I shook my head and got back to my senses, and the ringing was to a minimum now. The man on the roof looked to be a scientist or researcher that must have been helping out with whatever they were doing here. I couldn't see his body entirely, but now the man was holding his ears with the device still in his hand. You made this mess, the man kept shouting this over and over, until I heard the gunshot. Another operative must have gotten up there. My heart sank when the spray of crimson misted in the air as the hole burst through the man's forehead. His arms went to his sides and he slumped forward, falling the two stories into a crumbled heap on the ground in front of the soldiers. The device the man was holding lay broken in pieces on the concrete, next to the blood that began pooling around his body. Well, my eyes went wide with fear, and I couldn't stop my heart from pounding. Hostile neutralized. Clean up unit, come to the entrance. One of the men reported on their radio. Well, I should have left. I should have said to hell with the money and gone home. But now I was right in the stink of this crap. I just witnessed not only something that wasn't meant for civilians to see, but a murder. Alarm bells began going off despite the ringing that still persisted. Before I knew it, the soldier closest to me aimed his rifle at me and paced forward. Whoa, what the hell? I was blinded by his flashlight and raised my hands up. Stay where you are, he shouted, and I kept my hands up with a gun dangling from my finger. Easy, I'm not a threat. I tried pleading with this guy, did my best to keep my gaze fixed on the gas mask the operative was wearing. It was here where a constant flow of thoughts invaded my mind. Who was that scientist talking about? Who's on their way? Could the armed men hear the ringing too? Was their gear suppressing them from hearing it? Was I being exposed to radiation? Are these guys even military? Drop your weapon slowly, he barked, and I slowly put my pistol on the cold pavement. If I was going to survive, I had to stay alive and play along with their demands. I was rushed back to the guards building, told to stay put until they finished handling the situation. We were told to not call for the authorities, as a unit was already on its way for medical care. The soldier remained inside the guards building with us until our shift ended. However, we did not get to go home, and nobody else came into work that day. Well, the commandos were already freaky enough. I should have known better than to sit back and allow this to happen. But it was already too late. My gun was left outside, and undoubtedly taken by them. The jig was up, and Jeff and I were suddenly taken hostage inside the guard's office. Part 3 It was at this point where the entire facility had been taken over by this group. They had helicopters buzzing in to deploy more of these commandos under their order within 20 minutes. I know the sounds of a deployment pretty well. They had to have had commandos stationed all over the building by now, inside and out. I ventured even snipers and men with RPGs being positioned in elevated places. They were preparing for a battle. Well, here's what happened. Three days passed and it was Christmas Eve when the people took over the facility. They were in zip ties and placed in the locker room. Commandos would periodically watch over us. We were kept hydrated and fed sometimes and Jeff was actually still quiet throughout this. I did my best to tell him that help will be here soon and to try and relax, although it really didn't seem to faze him. We were basically POWs at this point, and I was probably a little more frightened than he was. I had to be quiet because one guy was really rude to us for no good reason, telling us that we were going to die here 
try to frighten us. We were already confused and helpless. Oh, they weren't going to just announce it, but there was no doubting we were fooled by some militia or terrorist group. However, I noticed a quick lack of morale with a couple of the soldiers. They knew they were in for it, and the actual military would be here probably any minute. Oh, if it wasn't for that guy escaping... One of them stopped himself and cleared his throat while the other commando remained quiet. Christmas rolled round. There was heavy snowfall and the command stated that a winter storm was approaching. This gave them the thought that any attack by armed forces would be put off for the time being. But they were wrong. That same soldier who would give a shit remained inside the office with another operative for a period of time until they were ordered to report back immediately. This is Theta Command. All units report your designated battle zones. Weapons free. Oh, fuck. I heard the one guy shout, and then looked over to us. Here, yeah. if you know what's good for you, I'd hide somewhere. The other guy scrambled out without a word. Oh, man. Screw you guys. I should just kill you both right now. But he didn't. He stood there and stared at us with his hands trembling. He screamed out and took off to fulfill his orders. Well, Jeff and I were now petrified in stone. Well, they'd only used zip ties on us, so we easily escaped. I remember thinking about just running, but I valued my life and decided on staying inside this building. Well, we got ourselves free and stood for a moment. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. Look, let's barricade ourselves in. We don't stand a chance out there. What if something happens and we have to call for help? Oh, Jeff said this to me in a surprisingly low tone. And we both frantically began bombarding the door using the metal desk, the fridge, and the filing cabinets. Well, the two of us were strong enough to get a good blockade up. There was no time to even think. We kept finding more items to put against the door until we definitely had enough weight to hold. Well, at least for a while. After we were satisfied, we both looked at each other, panting, and then over to the monitors. Oh, what the hell, right? I remember saying. And we then scrambled over there to watch the feed. What unfolded will forever be something that replays inside my head, worse than any kind of flashback from my time serving. It was an absolute massacre. First, from inside the building and to the right of us, we heard the sounds of armed forces approaching. A loud wham, then boom from within the facility, we saw the damage on the monitor. It was definitely an airstrike on Building B. A cacophony of gunfire then erupted all around us, and we saw in the feed as the battle ensued. I could see men fall into their deaths, small explosions, scientists scrambling out of the facility and getting gunned down. Helicopter turret guns ripped a handful of the operatives in half. Instead of hearing that ringing, though, or even jingle bells and Christmas carols on this holiday season, it was all replaced with the sounds of total chaos and bloodshed. Holy shit, I said, crouching down by one of the monitors, telling Jeff we needed to either get down or get in a locker. One of the handbooks stated that in any case of emergency or terrorist attack, an option would be to lock the door and call for help and then find a locker. The lockers were bulletproof and big enough for someone to hide inside of until help arrived. Bullets were already ricocheting off the building. We had to find some cover immediately. The locker room was a small space in the building, and I yelled for Jeff to get inside one of the lockers. Oh, if we stay put, we'll get shot through a window, I shouted to him, and he nodded his head. A louder explosion then occurred, shaking the entire building, and we stopped to look out of the window it came from. We were stunned to see that they'd managed to successfully target the incoming military chopper and take it down. It spun out of control and landed right where Phil would be stationed. A single window shattered then. We got moving while ducking and holding our heads. Having no other choice, we opened the lockers closest to us and squeezed in, getting down as low as possible. The suffocating dread was persistently clocking down more minutes of my life, no doubt. The gunfire and explosions outside were enough to drive anyone mad, but being trapped in a metal coffin on top of that was not on my bucket list. Needless to say, we were trapped regardless, and just needed to wait this out. After some time, the gunfire died down, 
We'd only occasionally hear a pop ring out every so often, and some shouting. The feed was still playing, and I had a thought. There's a record option, so I decided to get out of the locker and press the switch for it. I took a deep, long, and exaggerated breath, and then slowly got out of the locker. Jeff soon followed. Let's uh, check the camera feed. I want to record this, I told him, and he nodded. Looking around, we found a couple of stun batons to clutch onto in an attempt to feel like we could defend ourselves against any of the operatives trying to get in here and kill us. We then walked over to the monitors and found the chairs to sit down in. I'd say about ten minutes passed then. I don't know how long the fighting went on for. I hadn't even thought to check the time. The odds, for whatever reason, seemed to be evenly matched. This was a brutal battle. Getting a closer look at things as the feed was recording everything, we noticed just how many commandos they really had. How the hell they managed to station hundreds of armed men in that facility, I have no idea. Oh god, I don't even know what to say, I remember saying out loud instead of just thinking it. A short moment passed, and as if on cue, something else started to happen in one of the camera feeds that displayed an area behind building B and A. It was at this moment that a raw and all-encompassing new fear took hold. Well, there's really no other explanation for what I'm about to tell you. They obviously should have sent a larger strike team here to fight, because on one of the camera feeds was displaying a person clutching a soldier up by the throat with one arm. And he was doing something to the soldier's abdomen, but we couldn't really see. The man was at least seven or eight feet tall, maybe more, and was lifting the soldier up with little effort while completely fucking bare from the waist up. He looked to be wearing some kind of hospital garb, only covered in blood and grime. And with ease, this beast of a man tossed the soldier aside like he was an empty bottle. You could clearly see the muscle definition ripple and turn red, despite the quality of the feet. He just stood there breathing into the air like a mad dog, head violently twitching. Oh, this guy was an animal. It was already 17 degrees Fahrenheit out there. This was unnatural. Jeez, how the fuck is that possible? I remember saying out loud. Just then, the brute snapped his head to his left, as if in response to me speaking. I remember almost letting myself go right then and there, looking over at Jeff briefly as he looked back with shocked expressions on both our faces. Before I could even react... The man was no longer on the camera feed. Oh God, please help us, Jeff whispered, and I noticed him clearly shivering. I felt a horrible chill too, and thought about getting in the locker again. I raised my arm and pointed to them, and he nodded to me. We quickly got back into the lockers and kept the stun baton in our grasp. Seconds passed. More time passed. And suddenly, there was a burst of loud banging on the door, and I mean loud. One of the windows burst and a rain of shattered glass poured from somewhere inside. More glass broke, and I closed my eyes and felt the ground shake. There was this horrible squelching noise, as if something long and wet were writhing and reaching for something inside the office. Whatever it was, it was making contact with things inside of here. It even rustled the locker a bit. I was keeping my eyes tightly shut, and after a few seconds, I was brave enough to open my eyes and try to get a peek out of the vent. There were these red shapes appearing outside the small cracks. Couldn't quite see it all, but eventually the lights went out, most likely from this thing breaking all of the bulbs, and probably the monitors. I began to hear this raspy breathing through the wreckage, as if coming from a ravenous maw. I braced myself and stopped moving entirely. Then, in an instant, everything stopped. I tried my best to cover my mouth and breathe through little air pockets in my gloves, because I was basically hyperventilating. I'm honestly surprised my heart hadn't burst by then. God, I almost wished it had, looking back. A short moment passed, and we remained still inside the lockers. My breathing calmed, and I was able to quietly catch my breath. Oh, thank God for the sounds of the storm out there muffling my quiet breaths. Jeff must have been doing something similar. 
As the seconds rolled on, I listened closely for any sounds, but only the storm persisted. Once I had the thought to close my eyes again and take another quiet breath, I heard the most terrifying noise coming from outside. Like several nails on a chalkboard, although it was the yell of a man crying for help, perversely mixed with a dying animal screeching in pain. And that ringing came back full force, and I lost consciousness inside the locker. I don't know how much time had passed. I woke to the sound of Jeff opening his locker. Opening my eyes, he appeared before me and helped me out of my locker. You okay? He offered. I said yes, and he spoke again. I think whatever that thing is, is gone. I looked around. The entire office had been trashed. Monitors were broken, and there were these dark marks all across the ceiling and walls. Noticing the broken window, I saw the blood trail that led to the forest from the facility out there and breathed deeply. That freak of nature showed no signs of being harmed by the weather and had escaped this place. That thought alone terrifies me. I looked back to the monitors and noticed two of them still weakly displaying the feed. Both the bodies of the soldiers and commandos lay fallen all around, and I could see some of their weapons still intact. Jeff... I know this sounds crazy, but we have to go out there and find out what's going on, I said to him. I understand, I think, he said to me, and put his head down. As a former infantryman stationed in Iraq, I feel like it's my duty to go out there and figure something out, anything, anything. I stared at him, feeling that old sense of duty return to me, and he raised his baton. Hey, you need backup? He asked me, and smiled weakly. I smiled back, but I honestly didn't want the young man to risk his life, in case there was something else out there. Then again, someone to watch my six wouldn't hurt at all. <sighs> I appreciate it. Right, let's go. When we get out there, snag one of their guns, and let's try and look for a radio that one of the soldiers had. Ours can only reach within the facility. We might have a chance of calling out for their backup squad, I told him. Good idea, he replied. We devised a quick plan to get inside Building B and see if there was a communication center like their headquarters still intact. Right, you ready? I asked him. He took a huge breath and I did the same. All right, let's get out through the window. I'll go first. Watch the area, I said. And we went ahead with our plan to brave the storm and head for Building B. Well, there could be other survivors in there might still be armed and willing to kill us. I told this to Jeff, and he said he was ready for anything after what we'd already been through. I had the feeling we both knew this was a risky idea, but we were now in this together no matter what else would be in store for us. If no one else was coming, we had to do something, and we had to do it now. One of the windows was broken, and we could easily fit through it. The jump wouldn't be but ten feet, so we made it easily out into the cold. It was still dark, but the sun was about to rise, so we had a dim orange glow faintly aiding our sight. We both found rifles and searched for rounds and magazines. Everything was quiet now, save for the howling wind that attacked our senses, and we made our way to the entrance of Building B. The snow was pelting us in the face. We were covered in it by the time we got inside. The opening on the large metal door had caved in from an explosion, so we slipped inside, avoiding the small fires that still blazed menacingly in the wind. Part 4 Once inside, we found out quickly just how awful this atrocity was. Not only were there people shot and left for dead, but there were also bodies torn to shreds and discarded. That thing must have had its way with them because blood caked the walls and bodies lay in a gory mess. Bullet holes and charred marks from more explosions littered the walls and all surfaces. We both just looked at each other in shock. Go on, let's go, I said quietly, and we proceeded forward. Because I noticed an opening with some lights that flickered around a corner. We cautiously made our way through and got to a point where it looked like we would finally hit an area with the new construction. The addition was dug out deep below and made into this makeshift science lab. 
wires and bulbs that were connected hung up haphazardly to keep the light illuminating this entire area. I could see those large speakers embedded into the rocky walls. Sparks flew from multiple instruments and machines that buzzed or malfunctioned but were neatly stacked in certain areas. There was a large operating table with bolted down reinforced shackles that lay broken to the side of it. More blood and glass were littered around this area. I even picked up a few documents on the ground, but most were stepped on or covered in filth or blood, too much to even be legible. Scientists and soldiers, both our military and their commanders, were all dead. I was speechless. There were no words to even be said at all. We had just walked into something straight out of a horror film. Right, I'm going to go and have a look around. Look at those desks. You check that upper level over there. See if you can find a soldier with a radio. I told Jeff, and he agreed, aiming the rifle around and walking away. I made my way towards the set of desks that had computers still booted up. Some were destroyed. I tried messing around with one of them and opening anything that could tell me what they were doing here. Couldn't find anything discernible. Pushing that aside, I moved towards another desk and had a look around. More bodies lay dead on the floor, so I decided to look for a radio. I bent down to one of them, moved his body up to look at me. The soldier had suffered multiple gunshot wounds to the chest and face. Just then, I heard a cough and aimed my weapon at the source of this sudden noise. It was one of their commandos. He was still alive. Well, I had the thought of just opening fire, but I wanted to try and get some answers. His head was slumped forward, leaning against a crate, and I could see his ribcage was poking out through the torn body armor. He must have been in a great deal of pain. I used this to my advantage and approached him. There wasn't a helmet on him, but the hairline was oddly familiar. Right as he looked up at me, I knew it was Calloway, one of the guys that had made me sign the NDA. He spluttered and blood flew from his mouth, trying to say something to me. I remained motionless, transfixed on this horrifying situation. His arm was twitching and he attempted to reach for what I assumed was his wound. His arm began moving faster, and just as I realized he was reaching for something else, I snapped back and a muffled boom to my right rang out. Calloway's head caved in. The pistol he'd gone for dropped from his grip and landed to the side. I shouted out and got down on my knee, almost falling on my ass, aiming the rifle around, and found out there was another survivor. One of our guys had a silenced pistol aimed at Calloway and had just saved my life. He must have noticed my security guard patch on my winter coat and made the judgment call that I wasn't a threat. I quickly registered the situation and called out to Jeff, rushing over to the soldier while aiming around to see if anyone else was around, almost in tears at this point. I finally got to him and steadied the man in my arms, noticing his rank. He was the captain for this platoon. Jeff quickly made it over, and the soldier was reaching for his face mask. Jeff then took off the soldier's helmet and face mask for him with ease. There was blood pooling out of his mouth, and he also had severe wounds to the abdomen. Some of the blood got onto my coat and hands, but I didn't care. I needed to hear this man's last words now, or it would be too late. He'd just put his life on the line for this. Can you speak? I asked and he was still coughing up blood quietly. He didn't speak or move at first. He just looked at me with an expression one would only have on the verge of death, and then, with a slow and deliberate motion, he opened his front pouch and felt around for something. I saw his eyes close, but he smiled through the pain. He then frowned, put out a small USB port and offered it to me, still coughing. When he did this, my insides flipped, and I instantly asked, hey, What is this? Then I took it from his hand. The captain looked up at the ceiling while choking on blood and merely said, Everything. As his eyes rolled, his body went still. He took his last breath right there in my arms. There was nothing else to do but gently lay him back to the ground and let the fallen captain rest in peace now. After a passing moment of silence, 
I took one look at the USB port in my hand and decided on reading this now on one of the computers here. Jeff, cover me, okay? Look, I know this is reckless, but I need to know what this contains right now. I don't think I can wait. Jeff, as usual, kept quiet and nodded, giving me his stern look again. I made it to a computer and popped it in, with Jeff following. He raised the weapon to study the area periodically, but we couldn't keep our eyes away from the screen. There was a report with some attached files. Once the file transfer was complete, I read it all in one go as quickly as I possibly could. Well, to sum it up, this attack and gathering of information on a certain terrorist organization was called Operation Winter Eyes, and anyone available on call was sent to wipe out the force from a group called TNDA that was found on US soil, otherwise known as the New Dawn Administration. All of what I'm about to share is obviously not meant for civilians to hear about. But all things considered, I really don't give a fuck right now. Throughout reading this, I found out that not only are secrets and advanced technology being kept from the public, but ranks within NASA had been infiltrated by one of these members and gained information about a planet's moon that's never been documented before, well, according to the report. Which planet is not stated? Apparently one of those moons had proof of living organisms residing there. Thermal readings and multiple satellite videos displayed these life forms fully functioning and people were beyond ecstatic. A team was of course sent out into the outer edge of the planet's rim. The ship sent a team of 14 people and they came back. But something terrible happened to some of those astronauts and it was seemingly because of this TNDA group. Records indicate that someone from inside the spacecraft fired off some kind of relay signal that disrupted the life forms from moving and, quite possibly, sustaining their habitat. And these creatures were able to somehow collectively reach the NASA spacecraft from the moon and cause damage to the hull. Records indicate the impact on the damage report showed no signs of any cause for losing control out there in space. However, the report stated that several of the life forms housed themselves inside the bodies of some of the astronauts sent out there, and throughout this were able to pilot their way back to Earth. The report indicated that these parasitic anomalies are only capable of feeding, reproducing, and, if housed inside another biological life form for a long enough period of time, can essentially rewire the human genome down to the very last cell within the unfortunate victim's body. They classified the size of the things to be about up to six or seven feet long and were considered as being somewhat similar to Tania solium, or pork tapeworm. Scientists at the time of containing the initial outbreak were able to use cutting-edge technology to halt the organisms from causing any more harm, and only when the spacecraft came back to the NASA station did researchers find out that this parasite was able to perfectly take over and even mimic the host it's able to feed on or infect with its offspring, which are the microscopic larva-like organisms that infect your organs from the inside and eventually take over by reaching the brain. The organs and limbs are digested and somehow reanimated from within using this substance the larvae collectively secrete that's similar to mucus, and the main parasite can trigger commands through its own cellular network like a hive mind. It can then even intake oxygen like any other human being after a full assimilation, steadily growing larger and larger from within as the feeding continues. How large they can grow isn't documented, but there was a patient zero that was supposed to help them determine that in humans. The scientists were, at one point, able to test these things on animals like dogs, monkeys, and even large reptiles, with results that would make your stomach churn. What was supposed to be a simple gather and collect data mission in space turned out to be something unimaginable the man we just saw toss a soldier like it was yesterday's trash? Yes, Patient Zero. Patient Zero had no record of any identity, at least not on this report. Just that he was an astronaut sent out to that planet, and the name was blocked out. He was actually being hauled to a top-secret government prison when TNDA intercepted the smaller military convoy and successfully took the shackle brute to this steel mill, tricking Sam into thinking this was official business somehow. The military tried to track down the group, but were unsuccessful. The NDA 
decided that this was a golden opportunity and began experiments on the subject immediately here acquiring all the necessary fake documents to make everything seem legitimate. There was a side note typed out in this section that read, Possible aid from double agent. Identity unknown. The file also indicated that any other abilities of this organism, while inside a biological life form, were yet to be determined, but thoroughly studied. After more research, they concluded that certain vibrations, frequencies, and sound waves were able to control the organism from within its host, putting it in some sort of stasis. They collected that data from the audio logs of the mission, determining the sound waves on that planet caused them to, in unison, vibrate on the planet's surface and are contained within the atmosphere that way. But the relay signal caused the piercing frequency to occur as they approached the unknown planet before the attack. Whoever figured that out had to be a damn genius. That would explain the loudspeakers here, and it was recorded that the designated frequency would cause an amount of discomfort in human beings, yet the sound is somehow barely audible. It must have been amplified underground. When introduced to water or certain temperatures, it adapts to the environment without fail, as the cellular structure of these parasitic entities are not fully known to planet Earth. If housed and fed inside the invaded biological organism long enough, the human who fell victim to the parasite would appear the same as the person they were before, but only now all human emotion and empathy would have been devoured. You'd see a shell of the former person that they once were. The report also claims if the limbs are detached or removed, the cellular function within the reanimated body would cause a mutation to occur. Well, that was the only information I could gather from this report on Patient Zero, and these things they found. Anything else is either yet to be documented, or the government and TNDA know more. However now, since some assholes in a fuck-the-fuck-up doomsday cult disturb the natural order in the solar system, yeah, we now know that these things make contact with humans and can remain housed comfortably inside a life form and live like a twisted puppeteer sent from outer space. TNDA also had done their own studies, but I couldn't find any information in this building. How to exterminate these things has yet to be documented. Uh, with all this in mind, there was another attached file that explained how one of the underground hives and facilities under direct command of the United States government had, in fact, been compromised at one point as well, thus turning over a plethora of information as well as access to a certain satellite unit's mainframe. This sole perpetrator had posed as a researcher and escaped with all of this classified intelligence. They made the connection that, since that top member gained access to certain satellites, they assumed that he or she used some kind of jammer to block them from tracking their location after the capture of Patient Zero and fooling the military. The man or woman in question is known to be a figurehead in this terrorist group, and their identity is yet to be verified. The only alias they've uncovered is a single name, Goldstein, and from what the military gathers, Plans on using diseases and even create bioweapons to infiltrate certain military compounds and trigger an apocalyptic event to capitalize on. Surprisingly, over the years this group gained quite the following in the underground world of this country. Ex-Secret Service agents and even grunts for the Marines were blacklisted and it stated that cults were being formed with agents spreading the influence all over the planet. All of these targets and enemies of the state. The report also mentioned a steel mill owner getting killed after speaking to a scientist over a radio transmission, informing the scientist of roof access. Sam is now dead because he tried to tell someone about TNDA. Ray really had overheard one of those assholes telling Sam about the dig, and probably more we didn't know about. Ray, that lucky bastard, was at home. Well, I'm glad. Wait until he gets a load of this, I thought to myself. Oh, what a merry frickin' Christmas this turned out to be. After reading through all of this, Jeff and I stood for a long moment and stared at the computer screen, displaying images of men that had no idea they were being photographed. Men in suits getting into luxurious vehicles with a security detail, what looked to be a team of researchers or astronauts at NASA, and these monstrous experiments the military conducted on animals, and I could clearly see what they did to Patient Zero. 
Yeah, they sliced him apart and reattached him time and time again to get their data. Well, Jeff and I decided to get the hell out of Dodge. We found Sam's old company truck nearby with the keys still in his office. Thank God there was still enough gas in there to just get onto the main road and get out of there. We got in with me driving and took off down the road and past the burning helicopter. Once we made it onto the main road, there was a military Humvee on fire near a trail that snakes off by the main road as well. It was undoubtedly one of their checkpoints that got overrun in case the battle was in their favour and civilians came around. Knowing that this place was housed in the middle of nowhere and people were rarely seen around here, I had to wonder if people could even hear the explosions and gunfire, or even if the world was listening at all, probably distracted by their phones and devices. If they had thermals watching us from above, they let us escape because I never got stopped, nor did I stop driving until we were far away from that nightmare. This just made me wonder even more. One thing that stuck out is when I took a glance in the rearview mirror. I almost stopped the vehicle before I even had the thought to even slow down. Jeff had said something that snapped me back to staying alive. Keep driving. After he said this, I only nodded and sped up, because one of our soldiers was standing on the road watching us drive away from the steel mill, with his stomach entirely emptied. Part 6 This was over a month ago now. I haven't even watched the news or gone online. I just assume the attack was completely covered up as an accident or something. This is the first time since the ordeal that I've been online, I haven't heard anything from Jeff or Ray. Jeff asked me to drop him off somewhere near his house after that, and I decided to keep moving from place to place. I doubted they'd just leave me alone, so I decided to keep running, and keep that US bought from the soldier with me, for the time being at least. Well, I'm being followed now. I know it. It was only a matter of time before I either slipped up, or they were just able to find me. Unfortunately, like a paranoid moron, I slipped up by using that USB port on my laptop. I quickly grabbed it from home, along with a few important items. Well, I just wanted to confirm again that what I was seeing wasn't just some hallucination. But, well, it triggered something. A failsafe or whatever. And in bold words, a message popped up. This device has been compromised. I just panicked, smashing the thing and my laptop to pieces right there in my hotel room, and I quickly darted out of there. I'd already paid for two nights, but it was time to move on. I don't know who to trust. Maybe I should just let the military capture me. But I just panicked and destroyed the USB. Even if the military is trying to get to me, I don't know if I want that kind of involvement right now, after I just destroyed a piece of their equipment and ran from the facility. They've already shown me the carnage and lengths they go to seemingly to cover this up. Imagine what they might do to me. Well, I'm not only paranoid, but terrified beyond words, and I've considered just taking my own life after I post this story here. Maybe the military will help after all. Don't really know if I want to take any chances, though. Normally I wouldn't take such drastic measures, but I'm just a nobody anyway, and whatever they have in store for me might just be worse. Well, before I sign off, I said I was being followed, sure. But the TNDA or the military isn't the only force I'm worried about. That thing escaped from the steel mill, and there was another topic that went over my head throughout everything I'd taken in. These things are capable of infecting a host, and the soldier that was being gripped by Patient Zero had to have been completely taken over by now. I keep seeing these people randomly appear before me throughout my time of running. They'd be standing somewhere, eerily watching me from a distance. Be a different person every time. I'd notice them, and they wouldn't move a muscle. They'd just remain still with their eyes fixed on me no matter where I'd go. I'd walk through a crowd of people, drive somewhere, take a risk and grab a bite or a drink somewhere. And boom, there they would be. Faces fixed in a blank expression, focused on me and me only. Somewhere either outside a window or even close by, being mere feet away. If these things can somehow perfectly blend in with society, then we need to know. 
I can imagine you'd want to be kept in the dark about something like this, let alone fall victim to one of these things. And if TNDA somehow captures this monstrosity again, then who knows what might happen. Well, it's late in the morning, and I'm currently held up in some shitty hotel room yet again, paying cash and not using my card or real name for anyone to track. I've taken to drinking again, and eat sleeping pills like candy every night to attempt at blocking out my night terrors. Wow. Didn't even realize how long this had gotten. Even so, when you go through something traumatic, reliving the experience can become easy. I honestly don't know where else to go. So to whoever actually takes the time and listens to this, just know one thing. Something beyond our wildest imagination exists out there, and there's nothing we can do about it. Let this be a warning to those who wonder about the secrets of the world. Lock your doors. Give your loved ones a hug and a kiss. And remember that danger could be closer to home than we may think. Hopefully, someone who can actually help listens to this and does something. The world may very well depend on it. Well, I hadn't done one of these sci-fi military special ops stories in quite a while, and I do like them. I know they're not everyone's favorite things, but I like it, so <laughs> once in a while I will do one like this. Well, that was a lot of fun. A lot going on in that one, don't you think? Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say in the comment section below the video, and as ever, I'll do my best to join in the conversation. Now, that's another long one for you this week. Whew, hitting these hour-long stories out every time at the moment. Quite a lot of work, though, so oof, I'm exhausted. There'll be a podcast tomorrow night, and something probably a bit shorter on Friday. So until the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.